is my pleasure to moderate this panel today. The theme is shaping the future. Um, I would like to offer a few introductory remarks to get a discussion going. We live in a time of great paradoxes. On the one hand, massive leaps in health, well-being, and progress. But also, this has come at the expense of many people and of the climate. Uh, we've been forced to question and re-evaluate everything that has been presented to us as a good thing. Democratization, globalization, integration, and multilateralism. So what if we got everything wrong? Uh, how do you explain the whipsaw from Obama to Trump? Or a phenomenon like Brexit, which at the core is an expression of deep malaise? And how do countries, great and small, fit in the global realignment of power where China is at the, on the ascent, on the cusp of gaining great technological advantage, and the US is in retreat? And where do smaller economies fit in this? Do they need to be forced to choose? So I would like to briefly introduce some of our esteemed guests uh, and then kick off a discussion. We have the President of Armenia. We have the Minister of Finance. Um, we have Mr. Jones, who represents the Canadian government, and we have a wonderful thinker, Mr. Waslaka, who is a head of a think tank that he created and co-founded. So, to kick us off, um, <coughs> one thing that I would like to, essentially, if we could put globalization aside and politics aside, what would be the biggest leap, economic leap, that we could do as, as governments? Question. Like if, yeah, exactly. If, if you had to, yeah, to you, um, if you had to pick the single most important economic policy that a government could choose, putting politics aside, what would it be? Well, I, I, first of all, I would like to uh, to thank for invitation to come to to this conference. Second, I, I would like to apologize. I'm I'm sorry that I, I was not at the opening, because I was in, in Jordan at the World Economic Forum. Middle East Conference, which was quite interesting, and basically we're discussing more or less the same issues related to, to Middle East. Now, uh, what is one can do, and I'll try to be free of my position as a president, so I will try to, to present myself as Speak on a personal capacity Thank by you. all means. Thank you very much. At, uh, at the end of the day, I think what is can be done, it could be done for different countries differently, in the case of Republic of Armenia, I think the formula is quite simple. Uh, the small is beautiful, and the small can be very successful, taking into account what is happening in the world today. And to be a little bit more uh, provocative, because you uh, asked me to be provocative. I did. <laughs> I think the way we describe uh, the economic and technological future is quite obvious. This world is, uh, is starting, going into a so-called fourth industrial revolution. I would make it a bit more complicated that the revolution is not the ordinary one, that, that uh, we have a revolution and we have a long period of time of evolutionary development. This is going to be a permanent revolution because the amount of scientific knowledge and achievements that we have accumulated combined with the huge number of people now are involved through startups and others into this process, this process is going to be very, very dynamic in, and dramatic in some ways. I think what we are going to see, the rise of quantum computing, the rise of, uh, the rise of uh, new technologies in biotechnologies, of course, big data, and of course, the crown of this, all of this will be the artificial intelligence. I think it will be everywhere. And in my opinion is it's very simple. You should not be afraid of artificial intelligence. It's the same story like 30, 40 years ago or 50 years ago, people were afraid of IT. Ah, IT will come, computers will come, people will lose jobs. No, there will be much more jobs, huge amount of jobs, new jobs created, and the, what will change the, the quality and, and the type of the of the activity of humans. I mean, we will go into more uh, innovative work. So that's the uh, industrial revolution number four, but I call it our evolution, rapid evolution, mm -hmm. rather than fourth, because probably there will not be the fifth one. We will, will exponentially go up. But there is one thing that is important. This revolution is happening not only in economy and, and technology. This revolution is happening in our human behavior as well. I think this is something that we have all to realize what is happening here. 
And it's the same story like in technological world, genetics, uh, computing, physics, chemistry, they are going also to merge, integrate it together. Our social behavior is going to be the same. It's a completely new world that I call quantum world. Where, what does that mean? Individuals with a smartphone, mm. we have already, I mean, more than 50 billion units of equipment connected to, to the inhabitants of the world, 50 billion. And in, in 10 years time, it will be tripled or doubled, 100 billion. We're completely living half material life and half it's a virtual life. And this virtuality being provo provocative, let's look at what's happening on entertainment, two minutes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Entertainment. Entertainment. I think the biggest entertainment in the world is what? Sports and football. Mm -hmm. But now what we are seeing is that electronic games are bigger than physical games. People like to watch others playing the game. Why? Because the key word is interaction. Okay? So by being interactive, you're not only watching it. So all of the films, uh, television, serials, books, eventually they become, at the event of the, a game, interactive one. So if I might interrupt you, you've given us a powerful reminder of what not to be afraid, not to be afraid of, of AI. If I could turn my attention um, to you, Mr. Schletwin, um, what, what keeps you up at night? What, what are the challenges that um, you face as a, as a head of, e of economic policy in a small country, kind of caught in the middle? Thank you very much. I also want to start by thanking Horace Sistu and having invited us. I find it a very um, fruitful exercise. Now, from a small, open, developing economy, I want to tackle the question from two angles. The first angle is whether the current global economic model we have is bringing about equality, or does it perpetuate unequalness? And the second question we have to ask is, is the current economic model compatible with the environmental challenge that, that we have? Now, let me first start with the inequality question that needs to be answered. Our take from a small economy, as I've said, is, and I can say it up front, it is not. The globalization that we are observing and living in today, in our opinion, surely is biased towards the interest of big business and the, econo the, the dominant economies. The rule writing that is global globalized, whether it is trade rules, whether it is financial rules, whether it is tax rules, are by and large fending for the interest of the dominant economies. Uh, so much so that, to borrow an, an ecological term, these, these dominant economies are becoming predatory. They are fueling and growing on the backs of others. And with that, inequality is increased not only at individual level in their own countries, but also economically, if you compare countries, economies, or regions, um, economies. So we have to find ways to erode that inequality by rewriting the rules and be more inclusive in the rule setting rather than exclusive. Now, the second point is the environmental sustainability. If our economic model stays one that economies must grow, consumption must grow, how will we manage, how will we better manage environmental sustainability? And from an, from an again, a small economic, economy point of view, the rules are that we have to open up, we have to give access to of our markets and our raw materials in an unfettered way to the economies that have industrial capacity that can utilize open markets through erosion of trade barriers. We have not the luxury of the policies that they used to become industrialized. 
that ladder has been kicked away. And therefore, again, inequalities are perpetuated and strengthened. And that is on the back of the weaker and not um, the other way around how it should be. I mean, that's a great way to segue on to you, Mr. Jones. You're the Deputy Minister of Western Economic Diversification, and you bring a, a unique perspective to this. Um, picking up the, the topic of climate change, should environmental sustainability take precedence over economic growth? How, how would you view that? <coughs> well, maybe I'll, I'm going to actually rather answer your first question. <laughs> um, you can answer both. <coughs> So let me just say this, uh, you know, I mean, obviously environment is, uh, it, it would, if, if I was answering the first question, what's most important to economic development in Canada and globally, environment would have been my first uh, choice. Uh, and I don't just mean carbon, uh, I mean the state of the oceans, I mean access to, uh, to safe water, uh, there's a whole a range of environmental issues which are huge drivers of uh, uh, the, the possibility for people to participate in uh, the global economy. Um, I have a whole talk that I do about environmental policy and what I think it needs to look like, but we don't really have time for that right now. Uh, I, I would add, um, though, a few things uh, to the list. Um, they've been mentioned over the last day, inclusiveness. So we had in Canada a huge increase in our economy uh, after the Second World War when women entered the economy. They largely didn't enter the world of entrepreneurship. And right now we're having a second revolution as a, a, a bunch of other glass ceilings in our country are breaking. Uh, and we're seeing women able to fully contribute what they have to offer to our economy. It's a really exciting thing. But we have a lot of work to do on other fronts uh, with our indigenous people. Uh, we've made great progress on gay, lesbian, bisexual, like people of different gender identities and different sexual orientations. But let me just say this. I would not understate, you know, we talk a lot about external rules. I would not understate the power if people can unleash in their own economies the full potential and contribution that every citizen wants to make. That's actually a massive well of potential that every country has available because none of us are perfect when it comes to empathy and compassion and inclusiveness. I just wanted to flag that. Um, the other one is the competency of government. Uh, the agility of government, the skills of government, um, the existence or non-existence of corruption, the effectiveness of rule of law. I, you know, I do a fair bit of work in, in indigenous communities where basic conditions of security are major impediments to development. The same thing applies as we look at multilateral, as we look at rules. Like, you know, commerce needs predictability. People, you know, we're inviting people to make long-term commitments and partnerships. If you don't have trustworthy systems uh, of governance, we're in big trouble. Can I make one other comment? Yes, you may. So uh, this, is not, uh, this is not really in this panel, but I've been listening to the conversation over the last day, uh, and we're saying a lot of the same things. I'm in violent agreement with a, much of what's been said over the last day, even the things that are contradictory. So I kind of wanted to say something new, <laughs> uh, and, and this is what I want to say that's new. Um, We've been talking about critical thinking. And in my experience as a leader, critical thinking is, can, can get you into very dangerous places, right? So governments tend to overanalyze. We're really good at, at crit beating things to death. Uh, and then we stop paying attention when it comes to execution and doing things and getting things done. The skills of building, the skills of strategy involve negative thinking, critical thinking, breaking things down. The skills of building together are a very different set of skills. The skills of construction, right? The skills, you know, you, you, it involves being relentlessly positive, finding solutions to problems, building relationships. The reason this is important, I think, to this discussion about globalization is we've all been touched by the academy, right? The university approach to critical thinking, everyone in this room. Uh, we have a media that is, defines itself in terms of critical thinking. We have teachers in our schools who, we, we have a lot of negative orientation. And if we're really gonna kind of bust through and get a shift in this paradox we have right now, this thing we were talking about this morning, right? Uh, we, we have to start building together. And I think it involves a different set of ways of thinking. Right, and on that, 
Would you agree, uh, Sandeep, on, on this? Can, we, can there be too much critical thinking in, in the way that we formulate policy? There's an echo, I can't hear you. Sorry? There's an echo. I, I just wanted to sort of lob a sort of segue into that. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was, a, there was an idea that we can bring too much critical thought into the way that we are, uh, formulate government policy. Is that something that, that you would agree with? I mean, how can that be true? <coughs> See, fundamentally, uh, we are living in a world which has got two speeds and two directions. Mm -hmm. And that's the, that's the basic uh, process in which the world is moving. Uh, we have two directions because on one side you have the science and technology driving progress. And President uh, Sarkisian just now explained how this scientific and technological progress has taken a quantum jump. Uh, we could be living without uh, cancer. We could be living without uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease in another 20 years from now. Uh, we could be without AIDS in another 10 years from now. So we have a, we have a one, one direction which is uh, doing amazing amount of quantum progress. On the other hand, you have the political trajectory, the political direction, where you see the great powers are uh, leaving, uh, departing from the um, uh, uh, nuclear forces agreement. Uh, there is a beginning of a Star Wars that's happening. Uh, there is development of post-nuclear weapons, like uh, um, uh, using pathogens, killer robots, uh, and, and other kinds of weapons. So if you look at these two directions of the world, then there is a two-speed world. You have one part of the world which is, which is uh, creating abundance life, and you have another part of the world which is progressing but an extremely uh, so, slow pace to the liking of the people living there. So as a result of these two directional and two to, to uh, pace word or to speed, to speed word. What you have is in the, in the end is a globalization of opportunities, but there is also globalization of risk. Mm -hmm. So when we look at globalization, we are mostly looking at globalization of economic opportunities, but we are not looking at globalization of risk arising out of climate change, terrorism, arms race, and, and, and other risk. And they are also globalized, just as opportunities are globalized. And so the globalization of risk is undermining globalization of opportunities. And that's also another speed break on the economic development. So this is what the big word is. We have to look at the globalization of risk as seriously as the globalization of opportunities. So there are two different meanings of uh, globalization. And it is in this context that I, I, I look at the discussion on climate change and uh, the challenge it faces to employment uh, in a generation, because you want to constrain uh, climate change, you have to constrain manufacturing. Then you are reducing the prospects of employment in developing world. It's fine if you are in, in, in Canada, you can afford to be caring of environment and water. But if you are in parts of Africa and if you are in parts of uh, uh, Asia, uh, you may be caring of environment, but you may not afford to be caring of environment. And you know why? Yeah. For example, I, let me just give you one figure and close there uh, in reaction to uh, uh, some of the suggestions made by Minister Jones to provide reasonable amount of good quality water to the entire world's population, you required $100 billion a year. This is according to UN Water and World Health Organization. To address the basic problems of climate change, you require $100 billion a year to kind of at least keep the wheels going and transfer technologies. And the world doesn't have $200 billion. Why doesn't the world have $200 billion? Because the world doubled the arms expenditure from $800 billion at the end of Cold War to $1,800 billion today. You have the money to double the arms expenditure after the Cold War is over, and you don't have $200 billion for solving the problems of water and solving the problems of climate change. After President Donald Trump became president, his first visit was to Saudi Arabia. And in one hour of his visit, the first one hour of the visit, he made a $200 billion deal of selling arms to kill people in Yemen. So you have $200 billion to kill people in Yemen, and you can make that kind of a transaction in one hour. And you don't have $200 billion to solve the world's water problem and climate change in the entire year. This is a word. Thank Sandeep, you. Let's, let's stay on climate change because it's obviously aroused many passions. Um, one of the challenges that I find uh, as a journalist and as a reader um, 
is to get people to care about climate change. We all know it's terrible, but the second we read about it in the news, we switch off. So what, what do we do about this? Um, you know, is, is fear-mongering too bad? I mean, do we just say, okay, it's, it's all going to hell and, you know, we might as well enjoy our lives? How do we um, engage constructively in this issue? And I'm going to open this up to whoever okay. wants to speak up first. Shall I? Go for it. Well, uh, I, was, I want to make three points and continue where I stopped. I think you raised the question of climate change. I think we have uh, to speak not about climate change, but damage to the environment. It's much bigger. Uh, much, much bigger because contamination and maybe there are effects that are not, big parts of the world, for example, are contaminated with, with uh, radioactive elements. They don't act directly to the climate change, but they, they are making this big pieces of land. This, the desalination of oceans is, is another way of creating water, but the other way of, uh, of uh, damaging the environment. The reality is that the, we are, the world is making a lot of effort in order to handle this, especially the climate change. And the way we see forward is, is, is the green technology, uh, renewables, which is fine, which is the hydro, which is the wind, which is the solar, which is fantastic. Of course, all of that has big problem about the quality of the technology, the tariffs, how much it will cost to create a kilowatt of, of energy. Even with the best, best scenarios that we will sell less, less arms and we'll invest in those technologies, it will take decades and decades. From our past, which was absolutely black, we were burning coal. Now it's a sort of a greenish, we are burning uh, a bit more gas and we have renewables in several countries. To come to, to the future which is green, it will take probably 50 to 100 years but we don't have that time. I think the mad damage to climate and environment is going to be dramatic and tragic. But that's the reality, <coughs> that we don't have the technologies yet, we don't have the political will yet, we don't have the, the sort of investment in place yet in order to handle it. We will continue, unfortunately, burning less coal probably, because that's the biggest problem, but we'll continue burning oil. And that oil is a valuable asset. And I don't know whether brutally, like in Middle Ages, we're burning something that from which we can make food, we can make, make uh, a lot of medicine, and so on and so forth. So let's face the reality. This is the reality that we're facing. It's going to be tough. It's going to be engaging all of our efforts. And it's going to be bringing people to common sense. But even with the common sense, the investment is going to take time. That's number one. Number two, to continue what I, I started telling, that technologically we will be advancing and this process will be fantastically going around. But our social behavior, our political behavior, the way we run politics is going to change dramatically. That is going to be another revolution. It's happening today. We have to just see it and give evaluation to that. The next generation of children, Mm. A newborn children, what is the first gadget that, that they get? Uh, a toy? An iPad. Well, it will be something else. It probably would be something we an don't iPad, even know An yet, iPad, an iPad, and I think basically a two-year-old boy or girl uh, very quickly learns how to use an iPad, how to push an uh, application, an app, and go and find it. So instead of learning the, the letters, they're learning uh, hieroglyphs. We're going back. And then it, when they are reaching three, four years old, you give them a, give, a, a book. What they do? They push it. A book for them is a broken iPad. So this is a new generation of people that have these gadgets and they are actively involved. As I was describing, that entertainment even is going to engage more and more the way we are entertained with also the way we run politics. Mm. A lot of people are having huge influence on politics by using their gadget, by putting their uh, opinion on Twitter or, or, or Facebook and others, and it has huge impact. And it has, it's not only in developed countries. In India, only one company has 450 million subscribers. 450, and more, most of the gadgets are smartphones, so they can put their opinion. And this is the new way the politics will be run. And Mr. Trump, Mr. Obama, they knew that. 
and they were trying and they were uh, trying to bypass the, the classical ways of running the, their relations with the public. I mean, we go back. The first ones were, were radio, and mm -hmm. the presidents after during the. Um, Roosevelt was using and others. Then you come to President Kennedy was in television. Now Obama and then Trump and then Macron, a sort of young talented person that was uh, not known to the public. In a couple of months, he won the elections by directly accessing. And now it's hitting back. It is the same way of running quantumly the politics in Armenia. Mm. Who, there were circumstances, people were unhappy, this or that. A revolution happened in two weeks. No organization, no political party, no movement, nothing. It's just a completely different world that we are going to face. Absolutely. But the voice of in, in, right. individuals will be heard very strongly and it will influence the decision making very heavily. Mr. Jones wants to respond to you. So I just, I, I wanna just go back to your original question. Um, around people care, you know, how do we get people to care about climate change? Uh, you know, in Canada, certainly, I don't, we don't have a problem with people not caring about, people care deeply about climate change. Uh, I don't think complacency is an issue at all. Mm -hmm. it's, it's fundamentally shaping uh, uh, our country and its economy. But um, we all heard this thing, right? Uh, think globally, act locally. And this feeds into a natural bias we have as people to pay attention to what's in front of us. The, the, if you just look at the math on this, the question that you framed, sir, and you framed is the real question, which is how do we elevate billions of people in the world into a global middle class, not on a coal backbone? Mm -hmm. That's the question, mm -hmm. right? Because really, honestly, I mean, we do tons of work in Canada. I could go on for an hour about all the things we're doing on the environment. It doesn't really matter from a math standpoint. It matters how, we're, how this, this new industrialization process takes place. Uh, so we really have to redefine leadership. We have to be less narcissistic. Uh, I'm sorry to be a poster, but I, you know, my country is, is, has dramatically increased its spending on, on climate change uh, supports outside of Canada. We, we should be doing even more, right? Because it's, it's where this, we're gonna win or lose the climate change battle. It's not gonna be the local diet. It's not going to be, you know, a, a, you know, a lot of these high cost, small impact things we're doing in the developed world. The game is in the emerging economies and we have to figure out how to help. And, and I'm happy to hear more how we can help um, and we need to do more. So we need to redefine leadership. I, so it's not that people don't care. It's, right. it's that they're not necessarily focused on the high impact actions. I mean, one question I have, you know, for, for smaller developing um, countries is that the big Western economies grew on the back and at the expense of, of climate, and now we're occupying a moral high ground telling smaller countries, well, hey, you know, this is not a good thing. How would you respond to, to the need to grow and develop whilst, you know, being conscious of, of, of some of the environmental impacts? <coughs> okay, let's, let's start where it matters most, bread and butter issues. Mm. We in Namibia have a per capita income of $6,000 a year, right? What does a professional soccer player earn in the Premier League? 100 million a week? 10 million a week? Lots. 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 So the, the discrepancies are huge and these hypocrisies go on. If, if you ask yourself on the governance issue that was raised, we are all for good governance. It's an important element. But look on the African continent where the most investment goes. It's into those countries that have the richest resources and the poorest governance record. So we are not doing what we are preaching and therefore, we believe that our, our chances to actually solve the problems are pretty slim if we do not change these principles. If we are not serious with inclusive economic growth and poverty eradication in Africa, for instance, we will not solve the environmental question. And you are right. Poverty is the biggest enemy for environmental degradation. 
we live with climate change, and I can tell you right now, in Southern Africa, we have the most severe floods in the last 50 years on the one side of Southern Africa and the most severe drought on the other. That's climate change working. Who's helping us? Who's globally solving that problem? Because that, these disasters create poverty. And they make life for poor people unbearable. So I do believe, yes, if the quantum leap is, is there to address these problems, those bread and butter issues, then we have a chance. But as long as we sit in ivory towers and talk about climate change and the environmental problems and inclusivity and sharing of, of problem solving, if we only talk about it and don't do anything about it, it will not happen. I wanted to shift gears a little bit and, and go over to you, Sandeep. Um, if Mr. Trump gets reelected, what do you think this means for the world order and, and, and does it, is it a death knell to multilateralism? Well, I think, first of all, there are problems and there are solutions. The solutions are already there. One set of solutions are called Sustainable Development Goals. You already have Sustainable Development Goals accepted by all the countries in the world, including addressing climate change, education, poverty in an integrated way. You have the Paris Accord on transfer of $100 billion on, uh, for solving the climate change problem. The problem is that we are always looking for new solutions, but we are not looking at implementing the solutions which are already there and agreed by the leaders of the world and by the societies. And that's closely linked to the fact that the political leaders, business leaders, media leaders, they are, their priorities are to be questioned. I'll give an example about your, your company, Bloomberg, mm -hmm. okay? And other media organizations which are present here. In the last one year, how many times you put Brexit in the front pages? How many times you put terrorist attacks in the front pages? How many times you put uh, war mongering uh, in the front pages? But in last one year, 10 million people died in the world or more because of air pollution. How many times you put that in the front pages? How many times there have been television debates around the world about the death of 10 million people in the last one year or more than 10 million? 10 million is my rough guess. Maybe 10 million in Asia alone. Maybe there are 15 million. That's almost the number of people who died in the World War, Second World War every year. So if people die of air pollution, it's not a priority for the world's media. Brexit is a priority for the world's media. Even though Brexit has no solution, and nobody is able to find the solution, but for air pollution, you can find a solution. Mm. So where you can take an action, you want to keep it away from the uh, uh, sight of the people. Where you cannot take any action and just go to parliament and parliament and parliament again, uh, there is that you want to put in the limelight. So it's basically a deception, intended or unintended. And uh, that's where the problem is. The problem is not only where to find the solution. So, so can, why uh, it is happening <coughs> is that intentional. So, so you're describing something, why Bloomberg is not speaking about this, 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 it's speaking about uh, Brexit, etc. Why it's happening? Bloomberg is bad? They are intentionally doing that? Or is there something else? Why this is well, happening? Well, I, I cannot speak. Well, it's not only Bloomberg, it's the whole world <laughs> media. But anyway, if you don't friend, want to debate her, she's, uh, she's a very fine... But my, my friend, but, but the real <laughs> question... Did, did you actually, are we actually talking about Brexit no, but, but now? It's the I public my country to, no, to avoid it's, talking about it. the public a opinion? No, 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 very good. no, no but, the, but my friend, the right question is what do we do about it? And, and this is kind of what I was driving around, the, around constructive versus critical. Like, we can't sit here and dissect this. I mean, your, your points are brilliant. It makes no sense how much money we're spending on military equipment. I mean, it, there's a lot, but what do we do about it? Yeah, th what we th do about that, it. And how do we start building something better together? I mean, that for me is what we need, well, what we well, need well, to start figuring out how to, that's the conversation. Well, we well that's, a, that's, that's, what, right? that's what I want to come to. First of all, let's realize that people like us 
who are sitting on a stage here and in G7 and G20 have not so much intention of doing anything about it. Let's acknowledge but, but that. Sandeep, let so, me, no, but Sandeep, the word who can do about it is the common you. people. Let me second. come to that. There is, there is, there's a very clear reason why people don't care, and this is why there's a, you know, a, a Scandinavian girl who's autistic who's speaking truth to power because she is getting heard. Um, but, I agree. But my, and, and that's an important point. But my question really is about multilateralism. Are we seeing the end of multilateralism? And with, is Mr. Trump getting reelected the end of that? Are we, and this is, speaks broadly to, to populism, are we living in a blip? Is this a moment or are we in this for the long haul? And that's really for, for all of you actually. I think it's a fundamental question that we need to answer. No, we have to be determined to see that there is no end of multilateralism. Okay. We have to be determined to see that there is enlightened multilateralism. And we have to understand the difference between what is opposite of multilateralism. Many times nationalism is seen as opposite of multilateralism. Mm -hmm. But as Macron said and a few other people have said, the shrewd politicians who are nationalists confuse nationalism and, 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 and patriotism. Right. And Actually, who agrees with him? Sorry, I just need to interrupt and give a chance to a few other people to chat. Well, of course, one from a small economy point of view, we have no choice but to agree and support multilateralism. Mm -hmm. It is only through multilateralism where we who think s similar about problem solving and the rules that are needed globally to be implemented to solve the problems have a voice. As individuals, we have not a voice. And I think through, through populism on the horizon the, and unilateralism, our voice has actually been dimmed and mm -hmm. is becoming more timid. So yes, I agree that multilateralism is the only way we, we have to go. And it is also important to be more inclusive. You know, we, we, we cannot leave out 1.2 billion Africans out of the decision-making process of the world. And that is happening today. We have no voice. Well, I don't, agree, I don't agree with that. I think we have voice, and the question is, why on earth we are not using it? I was describing our voice, which is that small gadget, and I think we should see the, the, uh, the positive tendencies. We're speaking about India. IT revolution has created hundreds of millions of jobs in India, and these jobs are not polluting the environment. So technological advance and the new technologies related to artificial intelligence and so on will change a lot. Number two, individuals today have the tools. It is just about when they will wake up from their sleep and start using that. I was trying to give you an example of Armenia. Mm. I mean, in that revolution that happened in Armenia, it was not only the Armenians living in Armenia were participating, the three and a half million of Armenians live in Armenia, but there are four times more abroad. Armenians from California, from Moscow, from Paris, from, <coughs> from Calcutta, they were participating. So what I'm trying to say, do we like it or not? We can continue speaking about this world, which was the classical one, where two dominating empires were resolving their issues, Soviet Union and the West and the United States. Then a, a short period of time, there was one big. And then, we are now afraid that the multilateralism is going to disappear. In fact, no, because what is going to happen is going to be the rise of the individual voices. Initially, in individual countries, like in the United States, people bypassing this party, that party, were directly being involved, like in France. Mm -hmm. When Macron came and when Mar Macron is having today difficulties, like in Brexit. We have in in UK. I'm sorry, my colleagues in Britain. I'm here as not a president, but as a free man talking here for the moment. At the end of the day, what we see that what is happening in the parliament is not reflecting what the people are thinking. The right. people now, the moment the UK people will start writing you at Bloomberg every day, every day. <laughs> A million of two of Facebook comments or, or, mm -hmm. or Twitter, they'll be, you will be for, for forced not to speak about uh, Brexit or the moment the people from India or China or Europe will be uh, starting writing about the environment and that the environmental issues will be not be one million, it will be a hundred million, you will be forced to address that issue. So I am saying, mm -hmm. people, you have your voice. 
try to use it. You have to use it, otherwise you'll be responsible for what's happening in this world. And you will be continuing blaming politicians, government, organizations. Now you have the voice, raise it. So I think you make a powerful point about the disconnect between what voters feel and the disenchantment and, and the institutions. I mean, I think Brexit's a very good example of that. Um, but I mean, at that point, what do you do about the disengagement of young people in politics? That's, that's the real thing. Disengagement, disengagement of, of young people in politics. I can't hear it. No, who said they are disengaged? They're engaged. I, I, what about I don't think young they are. people who are not involved well, in politics? Where, where are they? They're, not, they're not engaged in Poland where law and justice is no, taken. No, they're no, not engaged I'm sure in, they in the will UK. be engaged one day. They're, I mean, it looked like one and a half years ago, uh, if you take Armenia and Armenians, they were all sort of unhappy, what is happening, this or that, there is some corruption, this is, mm. this, that. It looked like that this is sort of a completely sort of a society that is not interested in what is happening, they are just complaining, okay? And then one day when the sort of a critical mass was very high, just a couple of, of young people, young people, mm -hmm. and young is not only uh, uh, their age, it's just that by their spirit, started a movement uh, again, I'm, I want to emphasize, this was done without political party organization or anything, just the movement. And the focus of that was this gadget, their voice. And their voices started from 10. In two weeks' time, you had 100 and 150,000 mm -hmm. people on the square as well, run by this as well. So virtual engagement eventually in this world will bring to material engagement of people. So Mr. Jones, Sandeep, do you want to weigh in? So, multi is multilateralism dead? No, it's never been more alive and more needed. And I mean, there's so. I mean, you know, we again we over we pay way too much attention to the to the negative. I'm so bored of Brexit. Figure it out. The, the, <laughs> the, 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 no, but there's so many things going on multilaterally yep. right now in the world that are important that are constructive. Um, but we do have a bit of a challenge. Uh, I, I agree with the former Prime Minister of Finland who talked about the lack of projects. Um, we don't have uh, a lot of shared ambitions that, that, unite, uh, that unite us within countries and across countries right now. We're, we're all marching to sort of different agendas. Um, that sort of ambition, uh, those, those shared unifying goals, I do agree. We actually need a bit more of that because we're leaving the space empty mm. and it's being occupied by all sorts of very narrow uh, concerns. Uh, and we do have to deal with the underlying fear and anxiety. One of the reasons I was talking about the skills of construction and building is I actually think if young people were better armed with entrepreneurial skills, mm -hmm. they, would, they would be more confident, right? And part of what's happening is people are so fearful and anxious that they're not generous <laughs> and they're not willing. You know, I would love to, like, get all of us just figuring out how we're going to help you with your drought problem. Like, that's what we should be talking about, et cetera. I mean, we should actually be working on solving these problems. And instead, we, we're in these, the politics of resentment. So we need more ambition. Um, we, we need more positive uh, le uh, leadership. And we have to deal with the underlying drivers of those fears, which is, which is people's sense that they can be competent in this new uh, world. And it's also issues around, for example, example income inequality. So in Canada, in, after-tax income inequality has been narrowing, not widening. But because we're next to the United States, people pick up the story from the United States, right? So a lot of Canadians are convinced we have a similar phenomena. Um, income inequality is a very complex uh, topic. Uh, but people are certainly perceiving, whether it's true or not, in their own situation, a divergence in who the winners and losers are, right? So we need to sort of, we, we, they, they need, we need to make people, allow people, equip people to be confident actors, and we have to create agendas um, uh, that, that bring us together. So, um, but is multilateralism dead? No, it's, <laughs> it's in good shape. Sandeep, do you want to weigh in? No, you know, when I was a little boy, my father asked me a question. And I was going to answer, and my father said, no, 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 wait. Every question has many answers. And if you think all of them, you don't understand the question itself. So the answer to your question is actually the answer given by each person here and to, to form a compact. I do believe with our Namibian colleague, I agree with our Namibian colleague, that inclusive institutions of governance are absolutely must. There is no alternative to it. 
And I fully agree with my friend, uh, President of uh, uh, Armenia. He was my friend before he became the president, so I call him <laughs> my friend. <laughs> that technological innovation and inclusive uh, development of technology, there is absolutely no alternative to that. But the two are not uh, opposed to each other. Yeah. So basically, to <coughs> strengthen multilateralism, we need to uh, find answers which are at different levels and in different corners of the answer box. And they can all work together. The 16-year-old Swedish girl is a part of the answer. Mm -hmm. But efforts being made to re uh, reform the UN Security Council is also part of the answer. The answer is as much on the streets of Stockholm as in the chambers of power of the United Nations uh, building in mm -hmm. Manhattan. So <clears throat> what we, and, and as much in the, in the pages of uh, Bloomberg Media. So, uh, uh, so we really need to find answers at all possible levels. There is no exclusive monopoly of answers with anybody at all. What we need to do is to focus on answers. That's what it is really important. And to implement the answers. We are all good at conceiving the answers. We are good at getting global agreements on answers. But when it comes to implementing them, when it comes to putting money behind it, when it comes to transferring the technology, that's where we are lacking. And what we need is a more of a will and more of a commitment and a sincerity. Um, I want to, um, we need to wrap up soonish. I want to give everyone a, a chance to close up. I want to leave it with a question. Um, we talked about the stuff that consumes papers, like Brexit, and the stuff that we don't talk about. Uh, I'd like to ask each of you um, about a black swan. What is it that uh, we're not thinking of, not because it's sexy or unsexy, or because we, are, we should be thinking and it's somewhere out there. What would be a black swan for the next year? And if we could go around. Black swan, I, I, I take it you mean that the most unlikely Something um, unlikely will, that we're not thinking have, that will hold happen. the answer. Positive or negative? That's entirely up to you. Well, I, I um, cannot dismiss the, the theory that is behind the black swan theory that an unlikely event or an <coughs> event that we haven't thought about is the best solution for us. I, I um, come from a scientific background and I believe that evidence-based approaches are giving us the better solution. I do know that we have achieved an incredible amount through science, through evidence, that gives us enough knowledge to identify the problem and think about solutions. I do believe that we have a pretty good understanding what needs to be done to solve the problems that we, that we have. Where we are missing out is to properly resource these, to properly share these, so that they are equally, more equally spread the, the solutions and not focused in one or the other area. And closing off with my scientific background, I do believe we have the ability to fight our selfish gene. It is the selfishness at individual level and at national level that is one of the big problems that we have to tackle. Do you? Well, I'll try. I think the swans could be, and I, usually they will be both black and white. And I think there are small ones. There are big ones. Uh, I think my uh, thought will be, I think it's the time for us to be serious. Because the problems that this planet is, is facing are huge. So that's the black side of it. So we have to be seriously looking at the realities of this life. I'll try to give you a small, small example. Everybody is speaking about climate change and environmental damage. But I think the moment you sit down in front of your computer or a piece of paper and start to put together figures, then you realize that in reality, we have to spend huge amounts of effort, multinationally, globally, with huge amounts of money invested in order to tackle the, that gap as I was describing, between mm. today's gray and tomorrow's green. It's not close enough. It's not enough that Germany has done wonderful work. It's not enough that France is getting 
uh, getting sort of a greener and greener in Britain as well and others. So it's a huge effort. A lot of steel black is going to be burned for years and years to come because there's no solution yet. So we have to be very serious. For example, we all, I will say something which is controversial again, okay? I think we are, the, we have dismissed the nuclear energy as a, a source of energy because we're afraid of it. Mm. I think we are afraid of the big disasters like, like uh, the Fukushima or Chernobyl. Both of them are a result of human error, not the technology. But be, without nuclear reaching, for example, getting in big size, in the future five or 100 years, it will be very difficult to reach that green mm -hmm. as quick as possible. That's a reality. We have to be facing that. I mean, because the popular idea that and the, f uh, the fear of nuclear is there, what is happening in France is trying to get politically right to get rid of uh, its 70% of supply of its energy. Now, on the positive side, I think that there is so much uh, energy and good in new technologies that are appearing that will create huge amount of new jobs and will help us also optimize. I mean, it's not only about bringing solar and, and wind uh, mm -hmm. into uh, our portfolio, it's, all about, it's also about how we are how we're going to optimize the energy and uh, the, the spend of that energy, new jobs that will be created. And the black and the white swan in big way is the engagement of those who didn't have voice before. Great, I wanna give a chance to our last two panelists to weigh in. Sure, for sure. Well, you know, maybe I just, because we've been talking about Africa today with good reason, um, actually, we've been talking about the need to talk about Africa with good reason. Uh, so I just want to do a bit of a shout out to South America. Um, South and Central America, because we haven't talked about them, I just want to put them on the table. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, there are a lot of countries in that region that have made tremendous improvements in governance. Uh, it's a really exciting time uh, for that part of the world. Lots of young people with you know, decent basic digital literacy skills that want to jump in and participate. I, see, I just see a lot of opportunity. We talk about Asia like it's only China and India. Actually, Asia has a lot of countries that are really interesting. Uh, I, I see a world, frankly, that's going to have, it's not gonna be just about China and the United States deciding how the world will be governed. It's gonna be a much more pluralistic, multilateral world. We're gonna see the emergence of a lot more medium powers. 50% of trade now is between emerging countries not north-south, um, I could go on and on. It, it's gonna be, there's gonna be a lot more players, and I think that ecosystem is gonna be richer. Sandeep? <clears throat> if I were to mention one thing for the next year, there would be a long list, so I will not present it. This list could involve uh, generating $300 billion for water and renewable energy and education by reducing arms expenditure, the list could involve uh, taking off 2,000 nuclear warheads from their ready state uh, position, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm going to end with a small story of a small child instead of uh, uh, making a list and, and pointing out my one favorite uh, action to be taken. There was this uh, little boy, seven or eight years old, and his parents uh, gave him a magazine, and he was, uh, uh, and, and there, in the magazine there was a map of a word map. Uh, uh, there was a map of the word. So they, took off that page where there was a